Hello everyone, thank you for joining me today for our immune system webinar. My name is Cyrus, I'm a founder and formulator for Pure Lab Vitamins here in Ottawa. During this webinar you can type questions in the Q&A section on your screen, but please keep in mind I will answer many of your early questions throughout this presentation. My team will monitor your questions in the background, uh, leaving the big ones for me to answer after the presentation. I always enjoy this Q&A session, session at the end, so please stay tuned for that. Oh yeah, and anyone registered uh, for this webinar will receive a link to the recording in the next couple of days by email. It will also get posted on our website and our YouTube channel. So no need to take large volumes of notes. I'd rather like you to listen and follow the presentation. So that's it for housekeeping. Let's get cracking. Today's topics are... Uh, what is the immune system, uh, what are the key nutrients for our immune system, and how should we dose these key nutrients for best possible outcome. So what is called the immune system is actually comprised of quite a number of unique and independent systems that work together to protect us. Uh, wherever your body is in contact with the outside world, different mechanisms are in place to ward off or handle pathogens, and pathogens are bad bacteria, fungi, parasites, and viruses. Our skin, mucous membranes, in the mouth, nose, airways, eyes, and genitals, our gastrointestinal tract, all have different mechanisms to do that to reduce the number of pathogens that enter our bodies. Examples of such activities are our nasal passages swelling up when they recognize a cold or flu virus. They start producing lots of mucus to trap the pathogens and flush them out. That is why our noses are running. Stomach acid, next to help with protein, fat and carbohydrate breakdown, this acid helps to kill pathogens before they can enter the small intestine and potentially enter our inner systems. Our bowels or intestines represent the largest part of our immune system. And it is continually exposed to pathogens and antigens from our diet or from just licking our fingers. No? And it's the port of entry for many clinically important pathogens. We have enzymes in our sweat and tears even that help create antibacterial compounds. But once a pathogen has entered, we have more inside systems in our blood and lymph where an army of cells and enzymes uh, works to detect, neutralize or kill pathogens. And this inside part is what most people think of as our immune system. Also, inflammation is an important and natural part of our immune response. When pathogens attack healthy cells or tissues, so-called mast cells counterattack, and they release a compound called histamine. And histamine then triggers the inflammatory response, causing pain, swelling and accumulation of lymphatic fluid, swelling, which carries all kinds of immune components and cells aiming to, again, detect, kill and flush out pathogens. The heat in an inflamed tissue is aiming to cook off pathogens. Fever is also aiming to cook off pathogens, kill them by heat. And furthermore, histamine signals the release of an army of white blood cells to further attack these pathogens from all angles, swallow them, digest them, break them down in many different ways. Now, you can imagine, all these individual sets of mechanisms require varying sets of nutrients and cofactors. They are the tools to help make the immune cells and enzymes and to help them do their job. If just one of these nutrient tools is missing, then one of these individual immune actions stops working. And you practically open the door and invite <laughs> pathogens in. So today I'd like to provide some actionable information on how to keep all your immune systems firing on all cylinders and keep all the doors closed. One vitamin is directly connected to our immune system and oddly enough, as humans, uh, who are part of a very small group of only five mammals on this planet, uh, we lost the ability to make this vitamin ourselves. 
Um, all others can make vitamin C within their own biochemistry, so we as humans rely exclusively on our diet to get it. Vitamin C. When I started out formulating our two vitamin C products, uh, regular vitamin C 1000 mg caps and the vitamin C 1000 slow release caps, it was very clear to me that we had to go with straight out ascorbic acid you know, to provide a tool that allows you to dose therapeutically, which means as needed for the situation that you are currently in. If you're using vitamin C as a daily maintenance, uh, you would probably just take one or two caps a day ongoing. You know? And you should choose the slow release formulation to maintain blood levels throughout the day. You know? um, in response to initial symptoms of a cold or flu or practically any kind of infection, you could use a lot higher doses per day. For example, one capsule every two hours. You know? Some practitioners even recommend a vitamin C bowel flush once or twice a year where you titrate your daily dose of vitamin C up to the point where you experience a quite drastic bowel flush reaction to cleanse your system, detox the liver or simply fully replenish the whole body with vitamin C. These protocols can be googled very easily but prepare for an intense experience when trying this out and get guidance uh, or get guidance by a naturopathic doctor. Uh, now, buffered vitamin C's are marketed as the less acidic form, uh, milder to the stomach. These are usually sodium ascorbate, calcium ascorbate, or so-called ester C's. But if you were to do any of these higher dose regimes with buffered forms of vitamin C, you would, with those products, also put a lot of calcium and or sodium into your body. For example, 1000 mg of sodium ascorbate contains 110 milligrams of sodium no? and only the remaining 890 milligrams are actual ascorbate, vitamin C. Five caps of sodium ascorbate would give you 550 milligrams of sodium and 10 caps would give you 1.1 grams of sodium. Most North Americans are very high in sodium to begin with and elevated sodium levels can be very detrimental, no? not only to blood pressure but also to the overall state of cellular hydration and cellular health. A uh, thousand milligrams of calcium ascorbate contain about a hundred milligrams of calcium. Uh, so that five capsules would give you and provide 500 milligrams of calcium and 10 caps would give you a full gram of calcium. While this can be good, a good thing, if calcium is truly indicated, most of us cover our calcium requirements already from dietary sources like veggies, dairy or calcium fortified dairy substitutes. And calcium is the only mineral abundant in our soils. And too much calcium in our body can make you tense, tight, angry and constipated. And it can promote calcifications, especially if it isn't properly balanced with magnesium and if vitamin D3 and K2 MK7 levels are low too. So in essence, regular good old ascorbic acid like our two products are generally well tolerated, especially when taken with breakfast, lunch and dinner. And they can be dosed as needed without the risk of overloading the body with either sodium or calcium. So since the pandemic hit, one vitamin has received a lot of attention, but School Medicine and Health Canada are still holding on to obsolete recommendations. You might guess I'm talking about vitamin D3. Maintaining good vitamin D blood levels seems to be paramount in allowing our bodies to handle infections better. All kinds of infections, bacterial, fungal and viral. A variety of studies has shown that individuals with vitamin D levels in the upper percentile of the reference range had much milder courses of COVID-19 compared to individuals with lower levels of vitamin D in their blood. Also, low blood levels of vitamin D are directly associated with an increased incidence 
of upper and lower respiratory tract infections in all age groups. That's proven. You know? While I cannot give you one standard dose recommendation for vitamin D3, because D3 levels depend on individual parameters like diet, lifestyle, and stress levels, you know, I think it is important to discuss testing and dosing with your health practitioner. I also think it's fair to say for Canadians that supplementation with just 1,000 international units per day is not enough, especially throughout the winter. So for anyone interested in this, please visit our YouTube channel under Pure Lab Vitamins. You will find a large number of videos, but specifically look for vitamin D optimization and vitamin D and immune defense. I believe we can all agree today's crops, vegetables, fruit, nuts and seeds are mass produced and grown on mineral depleted soils. Just have a look at the almond plantations in California. Beautiful during the bloom. But these crops no longer provide us with our daily requirements, especially regarding minerals and B vitamins. There are lots of studies confirming this. Trace minerals are the foundation of a strong immune system. They function as cofactors, that means activators, for countless enzymes in our biochemistry. One of these trace minerals against viral and bacterial pathogens is copper. Copper glycinate supports the immune system in its fight against pathogens in two ways. Um, by directly killing microbes, uh, it's practically antimicrobial, and by being an essential building block mineral and cofactor for enzymes of the immune system. You know? uh, one capsule of copper glycinate, one milligram per day, should provide uh, most people's daily requirements. And as a true trace mineral, this could actually be used alternating one month on and one month off. That should suffice. No? Another important trace mineral is selenium. Selenomethionine is the natural storage form of selenium in our bodies. No? Selenium itself protects cells from free, damical, uh, free radical damage and improves the body's immune response no? and is also the cofactor requiring, required for recycling and reactivation of glutathione. And we'll talk about glutathione in just a moment. Selenomethionine comes in 200 microgram capsules and one caps per day is safe and plenty for most of us. No? It can be used ongoing. Zinc deficiency has long been established to increase the risk of infection by viruses, fungi and bacteria. It's an essential mineral in the production of all immune cells like macrophages, neutrophils, T lymphocytes and natural killer cells. It is also vital to the so-called complement system that works together with these white blood cells to fight pathogens. Dosing zinc glycinate at 23 milligrams per capsule allows you to take two capsules per day to start for two weeks or in an acute uh, immune situation and just one capsule daily as a regular and ongoing daily maintenance. No? Uh, this product is, is dosed with purpose at 23 milligrams per capsule, taking 50 milligrams of zinc per, uh, on a daily basis and ongoing would most certainly lead to zinc dominance within the zinc copper ratio in your body. I've seen that time and time again when I was still arranging and rearranging hair mineral tests for many of my customers in the pharmacy. And as promised, here's a bit more on glutathione. Uh, please imagine, water-soluble antioxidants like vitamin C, they float around as scavengers in our blood and lymph system to neutralize radicals and peroxides. Fat-soluble antioxidants like A, D, E or K protect the more fatty cell membranes against radicals and peroxides. But glutathione works inside the cells and all over the body. It helps. Get ready for a long list. <laughs> Just take it in. Break down free radicals. Regenerate vitamin C and E. Remove mercury from the brain. Support immune function. Uh, form reproductive cells like sperm. Um, glutathione 
helps liver and gallbladder to deal with fats. It reduces cell damage in liver disease and reverses liver damage from regular Tylenol use. It improves insulin sensitivity. It reduces symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Um, and for COVID, it uh, works as an anti-inflammatory, reducing cellular damage, and has clearly shown to suppress the so-called cytokine storms in the lungs, uh, which is the critical part in any severe COVID-19 infection. But all this only works if systemic glutathione levels are already present before or when a virus infects the body. You can't just build it uh, when needed. So a few, that was a long list of beneficial effects and um, those are just the most important functions and effects of glutathione in our system. The three building blocks that form glutathione are glycine, L-glycine, provided by magnesium glycinate, L-glutamine, omnipresent, and cysteine, provided by NAC, N-acetylcysteine, NAC. I could go into great detail of explaining the pathways that are necessary to make glutathione in all our cells, including the SAM cycle and also the two key enzymes involved, glutathione as transferase and gamma glutamyl transferase. No? But I think that I would make you quickly stare, uh, stare into space and uh, I would lose you. But here are the most important vitamin cofactors required um, for the cellular production of glutathione. And those are vitamin B12, betaine, riboflavin, which is vitamin B2, and also folic acid, which is B9, and ideally in its active form, which is methyl tetrahydrofolate or MTHF. <coughs> and lipoic acid and vitamin C. So there's quite a few. No? So a good bioactive B complex would cover most of these nutrient requirements. NAC and acetylcysteine is something to really consider here. And for the longest time, NAC has been used exclusively as a mucolyticum or expectorant for cough. No? In fact, in Europe, NAC is the number one over-the-counter cough remedy since the 1980s, no? because NAC has the ability to reduce the viscosity of mucus, which helps us clear mucus from our airways. And this makes NAC very valuable in any respiratory symptom management where congestion occurs, no? like bronchitis, pneumonia, but also any viral infection affecting the nasal passages, the bronchioles, and the lungs. No? including COVID-19. NAC is also very helpful in painful sinus infections where the sinuses are inflamed and pulsing painfully, helping drain uh, the mucus in there. Patients suffering from cystic fibrosis commonly rely on NAC by inhalation to help loosen the mucus covering their lungs and bronchioles. No? Inhalation, <coughs> I could use some NAC, is practically a topical application of NAC right where it's needed. But NAC does so much more than just thinning mucus. It protects the lungs from damaging effects of inhaled toxins. And, as discussed earlier, is one of the three building blocks that form glutathione. So how should we dose NAC or N-acetylcysteine? For someone starting to use NAC as a preventative measure for the first time, Take one capsule, 600 milligrams, twice a day with food, just for five days to replenish the system. Then cut back to just one caps a day, ongoing as maintenance dose. For someone already dealing with mucus or phlegm building up, and it's becoming more sticky and harder to move, take one capsule, 600 milligrams, three times a day with food and drink loads of hot herbal teas like chamomile and fennel. Chamomile is a soothing anti-inflammatory. Fennel seed is a fantastic broncholuticum. It relaxes the smooth muscle uh, of the bronchioles. And the heat of the tea going down the pipe also helps move phlegm up and clear uh, the neighboring, the very closely neighboring airways. So finally, 
uh, two other foundation supplements that I believe everybody will benefit from. A daily bioactive B complex, preferably in slow release form, and what we are known for best, a daily dose of good old magnesium glycinate. So that's it. I hope this information was of value to you. Uh, and at this point, um, I'd like to thank all our participating retail partners that helped promote this event. Uh, most of them have specials going on for the next few days in support of this event. And I will now get ready to check if there are any questions. Uh, please just give me a moment and stay tuned. Okay, we just have to change a couple of uh, things in the technology here. Uh, shouldn't take too long. I see there's already two questions um, uh, in the system. Just bear with me. Yeah. I believe David could use uh, change the spot spotlight over. Okay, I'll just start with the questions here until the technology comes comes after. Here's a question from Natalie. Uh, she's asking uh, which is the better slow release vitamin C or ester C. Um, as I explained in the in the video, ester C is actually calcium ascorbate, and by using higher doses of ester C, you also get higher doses of calcium. And I believe strongly that um, most people do not require additional calcium in their diet. Uh, our, the soils are, are abundant of lime, of calcium carbonate, calcium oxide, calcium hydroxide. It's barely possible to deplete the soils of calcium. And furthermore, farmers keep a close eye on the pH of the soil um, because they know that if the, the soils get too acidic, their yield goes down. Um, Sorry, I'm just switching. There we go. You now you should see me a bit bigger. <laughs> Not that that's important. So, and, and the tool that farmers use to um, control and manage uh, the pH of the soils is lime. They can get that pretty much anywhere. It's, it's fairly cheap. So by trying to alkaline the soil, we put lime on, and with that, they replenish uh, calcium as well. So... I would personally always stay clear of ester C or calcium ascorbate unless you have a clear indication that your body requires uh, extra amounts of, of calcium, which even for the osteoporotic individual is rarely the case. case. I believe that um, uh, the research here that and doctors recommending 12 to 1500 milligrams of calcium per day is, has practically more negative effects than positive ones. If I uh, or if my wife, my, my mother, my grandpa would suffer from calcium, they would never get more than 500 milligrams and really only if truly, truly indicated. Um, done. So Natalie also asked, and that's a common question, uh, what about the risk of kidney stones when using vitamin C at high dose? A uh, simple, quick answer, it's a myth. And it's stuck in the brains of our mainstream medicine <laughs> practitioners like glue. And there is no such case reported. Um, I personally have provided Ottawa with, uh, with uh, all its requirement in intravenous vitamin C supplies uh, when I was still running my compounding lab at Digital Pharmacy. We produce per month, and depending on the month, between 50 and 150 liters of 500 milligrams per mil, 25 grams per uh, 50 cc vial of pure vitamin C. And it was given intravenously in doses of up to 120, 150 grams, not milligrams, per session. Uh, kidney stone formation with vitamin C does not happen. It's complete and utter nonsense. Um, Shirley is asking whether glutathione, oh, that's Shirley there. Um, what is the benefit of taking vitamin D in capsules? Very good question, sure. Thank you. Um, capsules are not necessarily uh, a benefit. What is of benefit is to use vitamin D in dry, crystalline form. Vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin, and that's why some manufacturers chose to produce it in oil-based soft gel capsules. Um, the problem with that is, especially when you're using D drops, um, you can imagine if you take out four or five drops of vitamin D out of the dropper bottle, 
for each drop that falls out, a drop of air has to go back into the glass vial or glass bottle to make up for the, um, uh, the, the, the missing volume. So air travels through that oil um, to, to fill up the, the missing space. That means oxygen rises right through the oil and oxidizes vitamin D. Vitamin D is an antioxidant. It's very sensitive towards oxidation. And for that reason, unless you use a vitamin D oil bottle up in two, three weeks after opening, I dare to say there is not much active vitamin D3 left in that oil if you're keeping it on the shelf uh, for longer than that. And the same applies to soft gel capsules. I mean, as we as, as consumers, we think, oh, yeah, these capsules, they look like they're completely sealed. <laughs> and they are, and no oil comes out. But oxygen is a tiny little atom. And oxygen, nitrogen, even carbon dioxide as gases can travel right through the capsule and oxidize the vitamin D3 dissolved in this soft gel oil capsule. Obviously, vitamin D3 crystals are also exposed to oxygen, but I always kind of bring up this image of the, you know, these pink salt, Himalayan salt lamps and think of like one big uh, of, uh, salt crystal as one magnified crystal of vitamin D3. So the outside layer of this, of this uh, crystal is obviously exposed to air, but at least the, the, the density of this crystal protects the inside of all the vitamin D3 inside the crystal against oxidation. So dry crystalline forms of vitamin D3 are much more stable on your shelf at home uh, uh, um, after opening up or breaking the seal of the product. You know? Uh, vitamin D3 products are usually um, sealed and produced, especially the oil products produced under uh, oxygen exclusion. That means uh, the chamber where the oil gets filled into the, the bottles and then closed is completely filled with nitrogen to make sure there is no oxygen in the, in the environment at that moment. And once the bottle is sealed, the product is stable for at least two, three years, depending on, on the quality of the product. But once you break the seal and start using it, that's when the time starts ticking. And uh, I also, there's a little bit of an anecdote on the side. I have many uh, naturopathic doctor friends in Ottawa and pretty much uh, Ontario, Quebec. And I've had this conversation quite a few times where doctors were dosing uh, D drops in, at, at increasing daily doses and monitored with blood work and were not able to see rising blood levels of vitamin D3, even despite ever-increasing dosages. And once they switch to a vitamin D3 tablet or capsules, in my case, uh, all of a sudden, whoop, blood levels rose. Uh, and then they were able to kind of uh, balance out the proper dose and establish a nice high balance of vitamin D3, ideally around 100 millimoles per liter, which is the upper percentile of the reference range. I hope this uh, answers your questions, Shirley. And then we have uh, Celia. She asks, uh, will glutathione help with fertility issue for both men and women? Well, one segment in, in the description of all the positive benefits of uh, glutathione was that it actually helped in the production of um, um, sperm uh, in men. Uh, I believe the healthier the cells in your body and your bodies are, the more able they will be to reproduce. Um, obviously, there are many factors that can influence the ability um, to conceive or to, to, um, to have active sperms or eggs, and that needs to be investigated. Um, in general, if your body is healthier, you are much more likely to conceive or to, to um, yeah, to have and make a baby. Um, but if there's any troubles, I would most certainly get uh, uh, medicine, school medicine, to look at both uh, a husband and wife or, or partner. Uh, I hope that answers that. Um, Sue is asking, would NAC help uh, with nasal congestion and nosebleeds? Um, 
Yes and yes. <laughs> uh, nasal congestion, absolutely. You can actually feel this. If you are completely congested, if your sinus caves are full of mucus and phlegm, and uh, to the point, and they're plugged up, but the mucous membranes are continuing to produce more so that pressure builds in the sinuses. That's when you get this pulsing sensation that you can actually feel your heartbeat in your sinus caves up here or, or in, on the sides. Uh, as soon as you take higher doses of NAC within about uh, 20, 25 minutes, all of a sudden, where you couldn't blow your nose before, all of a sudden this stuff comes out. I'm also, on a side note, a big fan of the Neil Med Rinse Kit in contrast to um, the, the so-called neti pots, which I find very useless. Uh, the reason here is that with a neti pot, if you're completely congested, you can hold this funny teapot up your nose, but if it's blocked, nothing will happen. Nothing really enters the, the nasal passages and not uh, the sinus caves. But if you're using a gentle squeeze bottle, filled with lukewarm saline solution, which the Neomed Rinse Kit uh, produces, uh, you can actually gently flush uh, the, up the nasal passages. It's a very funny sensation when you fill up your uh, nasal airways with water. And it actually, if, if you want to explain this uh, to the end, uh, you do that over the sink. You plug uh, the bottle into one nostril and start squeezing gently. And uh, you will feel the water rise up. And when it comes around the corner and comes flowing out the other open nostril, that's when you start blowing your nose out the open nostril and you'll be whilst continuing to gently squeeze the bottle so to maintain the flow. And that's when you all of a sudden feel how water and with that mucus starts coming out. And it's quite uh, quite a thing. Uh, for somebody dealing with more chronic uh, uh, sinus uh, problems, I can guarantee you after doing this a couple of times, you're, uh, you'll be thinking on your way home from work, oh my God, first thing I'm going to do is get a nasal flush. Because after this all settles, you actually can breathe. And also your mucous membranes, your nasal membranes can actually start unswell with the saline. It's quite something and very healthy. Nosebleeds, when you have problems with um, nasal congestion, chronic, which could also potentially come from allergies, uh, seasonal or house dust, are usually due to like very dry uh, mucous membranes. And in that case, I would uh, uh, use saline nasal sprays to keep the mucous membranes moist. And, and then uh, usually you know, this problem uh, like re is, is reduced. Mm. Okay, I have the next question from Tay. How much daily salmon is needed for, with NAC to form glutathione? Very good question. Thank you. So selenium by itself, it has, it's actually a mineral, and it's quite amazing that a mineral can have antioxidative properties itself. That's quite unique. But it also has another very important function, and that is to regenerate glutathione. Uh, you might have heard the term of reduced glutathione, which is the active form. Um, just like vitamin C or E or A or K or any other antioxidant, like ubiquinol, glutathione can be oxidized. And without selenium present in the vicinity of this one oxidized glutathione molecule, um, the body would break down these three amino acids into like break down the glutathione molecule and then has to kind of start to rebuild it again. But if selenium is present, you can actually regenerate glutathione, make it active again right away. So technically, the selenium takes on the ox oxide from the oxidized glutathione to itself and releases another reduced glutathione. This is much faster. So with, with proper levels of selenium present, you're maintaining active glutathione levels much more efficiently. Uh, selenium is a true trace mineral. You can tell by the daily dose of only 200 micrograms per day and one capsule a day ongoing is more than enough or is enough, better said. Um, so I hope that answers Tay's question. Um, Mm 
Beverly is asking, which of these supplements uh, do people with asthma? Sorry, I don't understand this one. Which of the people who have asthma caused by chronic sinusitis? I gotta think about this for a sec. So you're saying there's asthma caused by chronic sinusitis. First of all, I would clearly think about what is causing the chronic sinusitis because that is something that most certainly can be worked on. Um, so I would assume that then the post-nasal drip is causing like a phlegm accumulation in the bronchioles and then practically congestion here and here. Um, and in that case, NAC is the number one to use. In higher doses, uh, you can actually go up to two capsules three times a day with breakfast, uh, lunch, and dinner. You should support this with selenium. I would most certainly use higher doses of vitamin C. Um, I would always optimize your D-level, whether you have chronic sinusitis, asthma, or not. Uh, as Canadians, uh, we need to get our D-levels up. It will also stabilize mood. It uh, help, helps your calcium metabolism and, and, and. Uh, cardiovascular health, diet, diabetes protection, that's all connected to vitamin, to proper vitamin D levels. So yeah, but in, back to the, if you say the chronic, the causing factor being chronic sinusitis, there has to be a reason. Huh? Um, and it's most, most likely uh, allergic. Um, and it's most likely dust, mites, or seasonal, you know? and uh, so there you can actually take a few measures, uh, rip out carpets, uh, use uh, like and, and get get into dusting on a on a regular basis. Use air purifiers. Uh, check out your heating system. If you have a wood stove, uh, you might want to uh, definitely have one or two purifiers running at the same time. Um, clean your ducts. Uh, stuff like that. Right? Improve your environment in your home, especially with COVID. We have spent a lot of time indoors, so we might as well make this indoor environment uh, as good as possible. Beverly, if you have uh, specific questions here, I always offer to uh, go into a bit more detail uh, by email. You can reach me directly at cyrus at purelabvitamins.com. I usually respond within two days. Um, so if there's further questions, don't hesitate to email me. After a webinar, it might take a little bit longer, depending on how many questions are coming. Uh, but I hope this gave you a bit of an idea. Um, Ron is asking, are there any side effects uh, for taking NAC? Um, no. Um, NAC can be harsh to the stomach, which is why it should be taken with food, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, cysteine overload in the system would simply be excreted. There's no uh, no um, side effect to my knowledge, especially not in if you stay within therapeutic ranges, especially since COVID has hit uh, many practitioners dose between um, 1.8 up to 3.2 grams per day uh, for a certain time frame after replenishing your system or after treating any kind of mucus congestion, you could then... Uh, after one or two weeks, dose down to a maintenance dose of usually one to three caps a day with food. Okay. Tay is asking John. <laughs> I think it's the, the, the crew from uh, St. Catharines. Well, well, well. Participating here again. Uh, that's my assumption here. Um, Ron is asking... Who shouldn't take NAC? High blood pressure or low blood pressure? Um, by, they all, they both should take it. There is, uh, from my point of view, no negative effect on blood pressure. Uh, there's clearly cardiovascular protective uh, effects from glutathione uh, built from NAC. Uh, that is clearly established. Um, any kind of chronic inflammatory condition can use NAC. Any kind of cardiovascular inflammation that leads into um, plaque formation, can use NAC. Um, yeah, no, no uh, concern from my point of view here. Um, Tay is asking, is there any concern taking six caps of NAC C100 per day? No. 
um, we have given, especially in acute situations, not long term, uh, higher doses than that. But I think that uh, for the average person, one capsule three times a day should be enough, especially if you already have used NAC to rebuild your tissue levels of glutathione uh, before any kind of acute or uh, situation occurred, then you don't need to go that high because you've already kind of provided it for a certain amount of time. That means you don't need as much uh, peak doses or as high peak doses um, than needed. But if you have never used NAC before and then there is a kind of a, an infection happening, uh, I would feel very comfortable recommending two capsules three times a day with food um, for two weeks and then dose down. That should do the job. Yeah, uh, as I said, to, to, I, I just explained that one or two weeks. So I'm just working down all these questions. And I'm, I'm not answering the typed questions uh, as they occur. So then sometimes there's comments below that, uh, that I just talked about. Um, Maria, hi Maria. Uh, she's asking if any of these immune boosting vitamins com uh, combinations increase white blood cell count. Yes, zinc, C, copper. Um, you should definitely check also your iron levels and make sure they are okay. Um, I would always include a B complex because in the in the large army of enzymes, for them to do their job, B vitamins are always involved. Um, using a B complex in slow release form is hugely beneficial because B vitamins are water soluble, just like vitamin C. They flush through us very quickly. And uh, a regular B complex is only active in the blood for uh, 30 to 60 minutes, depending on the dose. Whereas a slow release formulation can actually be active and present for eight to 10 hours, depending on the, on the product. So yeah, uh, that would be the list. And D. Uh, but D optimization should be on everybody's plate anyways, all the time. Um, we all do not get enough. Uh, Shirley says, thank you. Anonymous asks whether the supplements ever be available in a glass bottle. Not that I, I can see. Um, I believe that currently we are facing tremendous supply chain issues. We have chosen to use an amber uh, PET bottle, PET, which is fully recyclable. Um, and and, and uh, uh, I, I get it. I mean, especially somebody who is using supplements um, regularly goes through a lot of bottles. Uh, I personally always reuse them as my spice bottles. But even that cabinet, cabinet is at some point full. Um, it's actually quite nice. You can put the, the empty bottle into warm water. The, the label comes off clean. And then you can uh, use these amber bottles in the different sizes for all your uh, spice variety. It looks actually quite nice. I always uh, encourage people to reuse uh, stuff. But uh, at this point, I don't see for us to go into glass. Uh, we have always looked into uh, more modern um, um, uh, compostable um, forms that are slowly coming out. Uh, you might have heard of this story where somebody in Mexico made uh, plastic um, utensils uh, from avocado um, seeds. And I was hoping that that would kind of uh, take off and we would be able to get a strong bottle of that kind compostable uh, for vitamins. But the requirements we have in regards to air tightness and 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 uh, resisting moisture are are um, quite specific. So that I have not seen anything. I, I don't like Tetra Pak as well, which is like even worse than than a clean PET bottle um, because of the layering of uh, various kinds of materials uh, glued together. So yeah, uh, no. Um, glass anytime soon. Oh, that's a question that we didn't even talk about. Sure is asking, how is our carbon iron more absorbable than other types? Um, nice question. Um, 
When I compare carbon iron to iron salts like fumarate, sulfate, uh, gluconate, even this glycinate, and all the other salt forms, you can imagine a salt dissolves in gastric acid fairly quickly. So the whole dose releases and the iron uh, kind of gets or is, is, is released and uh, like layering onto the mucous membrane of the gastrointestinal tract, the, the, the stomach and the duodenum. And you can actually feel this because many uh, salt products, iron salt products like sulfate, fumarate, gluconate, when you take the pill within 5-10 minutes, you actually get this stomach pain, which is the mucous membranes practically going into an iron shock. And that membrane is no longer absorbing. It's shutting down, which is why salt products that release fast um, already have a significantly reduced uh, bioavailability. In contrast to that, carbonyl iron is metallic iron. Uh, think of uh, carbonyl iron as uh, like as carbon is in medicinal carbon. We have super fine powder particles um, that make this carbonyl iron, and each particle still has like all kinds of cracks and caves and and um, uh, crevices, creating a huge surface area similar to medicinal charcoal. So then gastric acid gets in touch and slowly dissolves iron ions from this metallic particle. And it's the slowness of dissolution that allows uh, for like continuous penetration through the membranes without irritating the gastrointestinal uh, lining. And with that, we're achieving a bioavailability of 69%. Per, man, per raw material manufacturer. And the results we see confirm that. Um, the other very significant effect of color iron is if more gets into the blood, then less stays behind in the gut lumen. And it's this unabsorbed portion that is responsible for the most uh, irritating and annoying um, side effect, which is constipation. Huh? So if we managed to get more into, into the body and less staying back, we also reduce the uh, um, constipation side effect. And anybody who has used carbon iron long term knows that it, at therapeutic dosing of one to two capsules per day, does not cause constipation. In fact, people are actually streaming towards this product. It's our second best selling uh, product in, in the market. I hope that answers it. If there's any other questions on iron, ferritin, and the like, please just shoot me an email. Cyrus at purelifevitamins.com. Okay. Well, that's a, it's an interesting question from Anonymous again. What causes my B12 levels to read high when I do not take a supplement? Good question, and I wish I had an answer to be honest. Uh, I've seen it not often, but uh, it is out there that uh, some individuals, even without supplementation of B12 itself or the use of a B complex, uh, have completely overshooting B12 levels. And even doctors shrug their shoulders. They go, oh, you're so high. Um, B12 in the diet is contained mostly in red meats, uh, um, organ meats, and uh, I think a few nuts and seeds have B12. Uh, so you could look at that, but I, I doubt that you're consuming excessive amounts of, of, of red meats and organ meats. Um, I've also yet to learn of anything that you could do to naturally lower your B12 levels. Uh, even though I also, just to kind of ease your mind, uh, I've yet to see any kind of um, substantial a negative effect of high B12 levels. They are just tested high. You know? But I admit I don't have an answer to that question. And yeah, obviously, with this in mind, you would probably hesitate to use a B complex. And there is not, there are not many B complex supplements out there that do not include B12. In our case, the two capsules per day give you a thousand micrograms of active B12, methyl, methylcobalamin. You know? So it's a bit of a catch-22 situation here. And I wish I could give you a better answer. So I'm, I'm sorry. 
Um, Alexi is uh, thanking me. Thank you, Alexi, for listening and thank you for your time. Um, and then there's Monique asking whether NAC would be good for a varicose vein problem. Um, let me think about that for a second. Um, I believe inflammation is truly an underlying factor um, for the development of um, varicose veins. I further believe that connective tissue health is another factor that should be considered here um, because if the surrounding connective tissue in the peripher per uh, periphery, in the limbs, most like most common in the legs, is um, full of waste that the body cannot properly excrete, then there's a much higher uh, tendency and likelihood to create inflammation due to the accumulation of waste. What I'm aiming here at is uh, actually another of my products called Alcapure, which if you take it on at full label dose twice daily uh, with lots of water and at the same time exercise, you're actually providing a deep tissue cleanse of the connective tissues in your extremities. And with that, you will lower inflammation quite significantly and effectively. Um, I believe uh, next month is a webinar on Arcapure coming up. There might also be one on our YouTube channel where I focus on skin health, uh, alkaline therapy for skin health, uh, even though that webinar is, is aiming uh, more for like cosmetic purposes. Uh, the explanations that I provide there are equally uh, relevant to somebody dealing with um, varicose veins. Problem with them, just to be true and honest, um, I mean, a varicose vein is practically a dilated um, uh, vein uh, where the connective tissue has weakened and it's bulging. Um, I, I would assume that it will be very difficult to um, reverse that. Um, there's a supplement um, that I know has done or has worked well in the past, and that's uh, chestnut extract, or the active ingredient is called routine, R-U-T-I-N, that can, uh, comes uh, in, in a variety of uh, um, different dosage regimes, and I will dose this high. Uh, but I think, back to your question, I think NAC is always a good idea. Um, I believe that the stress levels we are exposed to deplete us of key nutrients like vitamin D3 and also glutathione. So by elevating D3 intake back to a <coughs> optimum amount is never bad. And um, at the same time, replenishing your cellular levels of glutathione and maintaining them with uh, selenium at the same time is also never a bad idea. You know? um, what does help with varicose veins, and that's okay to do in the winter, but not so nice in the summer, is compression uh, therapy. Um, that should be applied by a professional, um, meaning that uh, you should, like the, the things you can buy over the counter, uh, stockings or, or leggings or panties, um, they are, depending on severity, not strong enough. You would need a a, or a prescription strength, and they are okay to wear in the winter while well, it's cold, but in the summer, oof. And in the summer, it's actually the time when you would need to wear them most because of um, more pronounced symptoms uh, with varicose veins um, in the heat. Yeah, so it's tricky. Exercise is crucial, and if you do exercise with uh, compression support, that's actually the, the best case scenario and do that daily. I hope that answers most of your, or answers your questions, uh, Monique. Ron Riley says, I repeat, excellent seminar as usual. Thank you. Thank you, Riley. Thank you for your time. This is why uh, 
the Q&A is always fun. Oh, this is John. I assume it's the John from Well, Well, Well in St. Catharines. Uh, he's asking whether, oh yeah, whether carbon iron works like uh, iron from a cast iron pen. Absolutely. The amounts that actually dissolve while cooking uh, from a, from a um, cast iron pen, which in the, in the olden days, that was the main source of iron. You know? uh, like using utensil pots, pans in iron form, nobody knew to supplement uh, with iron in those days. And using uh, even a, a uh, what's it called again, a uh, not varnished pan, but a seasoned pan, uh, even if it's coated with oil, there's always some iron kind of diffusing uh, through into the food. Um, you know, you can't use uh, tomatoes or make tomato sauces in cast iron because the acidity in the tomatoes actually dissolves too much and, and corrodes uh, the pan and, and, and the, the coating kind of gets worn out. Uh, even though you would get a lot of iron in doing so, it also doesn't taste so well because it dissolves too much iron out of the pan. But yes, uh, John, you're, you're, um, you're right. Uh, using For anybody dealing with uh, iron deficiency, uh, switching to... Uh, Uncoated cast iron cookware would be a good idea, but you should also always, in that case, uh, monitor your ferritin levels to be in the know where you are. Uh, Shirley says, great explanation of carbon iron. Thank you. Thank you, Shirley. Um, uh, Monique says, because I, that was the, the question on the varicose veins, I already take Alcapure two times a day. I assume you're taking one capsule two times a day. And when you look on the label, it says three capsules two times a day. Also, very important on Alcapure or alkaline therapy. It's one of my favorite products. I actually, over the years, I have learned so much on what alkaline therapy can do for us and how valuable and powerful it is. Gastric acid is the only good acid in our bodies. And if you take Alcapure just before, during, or after a meal, you're actually neutralizing gastric acid when your body just made it to receive the meal, to break down fats, carbs, and, iron, uh, and proteins, and, 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 and kind of start the digestive juice flow. So you do not take Alcapure anywhere close to mealtime, Ideally, you take it on an empty stomach, which for me means between the meals. So for most people, that means mid-morning, 10 o'clock, like as far away from breakfast and lunch, right in the middle, um, and then mid-afternoon between lunch and dinner, and then again, if necessary, uh, bedtime. You know? So you can choose between these three times. People that are fasting in the morning could use Alcapure in the morning. Um, as long as breakfast is another couple of hours or one and a half hours away. So great. So maybe review that, uh, Monique, and maybe bump it up to three caps twice daily. Anonymous has interesting questions here. He's, he's asking me about his uh, glomerular filt filtration rate, GFR. And I have studied that in pharmacy school back in the 1980s. Um, and I have to think about your question because he's asking if the kidney filtration rate is unreliable after a certain age, uh, which vitamins should be avoided? Um, from my point of view, like only those that do contain electrolytes, especially sodium potassium. Uh, and I'm sure that the urologist will have talked to you about sodium intake. Um, but I also always find that um, you should ask the urologist back whether you should potentially look at potassium levels um, or find a product that is sodium potassium balanced. Um, in my experience, 
um, similar to this old mare of uh, vitamin C causing kidney stones. There's also old beliefs on um, how somebody with uh, kidney uh, problems or kidney failure um, should be handling electrolytes. We need them. No? We need to be monitored more closely. But in many cases, we require uh, patients with uh, GFR problems um, still require electrolytes, and many of them actually do require potassium in some somewhat higher amounts. So that needs to be discussed. And I don't know enough about your situation to give you like a specific recommendation. I think that needs to be investigated. And you might have learned by now that not many medical doctors investigate on your behalf. So that means you have to do the studying yourself or you're lucky and you meet somebody that actually explains this to you properly. Uh, but it has to be done with reality at hand. So I would, I, uh, blood work needs to be looked at and then discussed or your individual case needs to be discussed what is needed for you and whatnot. All other vitamins, even magnesium, even though it's a mineral, uh, should not be a problem. B vitamins are not a problem. They're actually helping the kidneys do their job. Um, most antioxidants, vitamin C, is not a problem. But if you're hesitant, you have no other choice but to ask your urologist, and then it depends on that doctor, that person, to give you either a good or a bad answer. Uh, many doctors just completely shut out supplements or vitamins altogether. I don't know why, but uh, that's our reality. And Ron is asking whether NAC will cause kidney stones. No, no. There's no cysteine stone formation. It doesn't exist. And uh, yeah, John confirms he is, he is uh, working under the under the name Tay. Hi, John. Uh, always nice. I wish I could. Uh, I mean, soon we'll be traveling again. No, I'll go with Robin, in this case, uh, our sales rep in, in Southern Ontario. Kathleen says, thank you. Interesting as usual. Th thank you, Kathleen, for your time. And Ron is asking, why not take NAC? with antibiotics. I, I'm not sure where you're coming from, Ron. Um, I mean, I, I'm obviously, I'm, I'm a pharmacist. I, I see the need for antibiotics. And obviously, we, we all know that antibiotics are being overprescribed. And that's, that is why we have so many uh, bacterial resistances against most common antibiotics. And it gets harder and harder to treat um, MRSA uh, C. difficile and various other forms of, of germs. But yeah, I mean, if you have a bronchitis and the doctor prescribes antibiotics, absolutely, I would use NAC as well. No? But I don't know, because you asked about kidney problems before and kidney stones, I'm not sure how, whether this question is now related to that or not. If there's any specific question you have for a specific case, Please don't hesitate and email me and we will have a little chat. Oh, Connie McMill. Sorry, Connie. I'm not supposed to say last names. Uh, how can you get off PPI medication? Easy. <laughs> it is actually very easy. And I've done it hundreds of times with customers in the pharmacy. Proton pump inhibitors, from my point of view, are the downfall of human civilization. Um, obviously, if you have a, an acute ulcer and you need to block gastric acid to allow the stomach to heal, those are medications I would use for as short as possible. The way PPIs are prescribed today is wrong. Having reflux uh, or, or um, gastric acid regurgitations on a regular basis, from my point of view, is nothing but a symptom of a much bigger problem, which is systemic hyperacidity. Stress, diet, and our lifestyle elevate acid levels in our system. And then 
that also kind of it depletes your body of balancing alkalinity. And if stress, diet, and lifestyle don't stop and change, then at some point, even small amounts of gastric acid produced in the stomach will give you the symptom of reflux. So the solution is not to block acid, <laughs> but to increase the buffering capacity in your body by you making your body more alkaline. You can try that with avoiding all the acidifying foods. Um, you can try that by increasing more alkalining foods, all the green stuff, and, 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 and so forth. Uh, I have this, this uh, webinar on our website and YouTube channel that explains that in, in, in detail. But in, when, now back to your question, in order to actually get rid of the proton pump inhibitors, because as um, blocking uh, drugs, if you take the blockage away, Obviously, you get a flood. Huh? If, you take, if you break down the dam, there will, be, there will be a flood. So if you stop a PPI, you will, within two, three days, have quite severe gastric acid reflux symptoms, which will then force you to take more of the prescription. But Alcapure uh, works easily and, and well in doing that. And uh, Connie, I encourage you to email me. We have a quick... Uh, email conversation, I can send you the dosage protocol for Alcapure and how to exactly get off the PPI. It takes two weeks, maybe three, and you'll be coasting without symptoms uh, on Alcapure, and you cut out a very, uh, from my point of view, uh, detrimental drug out of your daily regime. Huh? Um, actually, I will plan a full-on webinar on that uh, for later. Hope that uh, that works for you. Cyrus at purelabvitamins.com Okay, John is asking whether 50 milligrams of zinc per day is too much on a daily basis. I have proof, John. Um, I've handed out probably four or five hundred uh, hair mineral tests over the years and many of those were retests. And many of the initial tests showed low zinc levels. And obviously, we started dosing zinc at what was available at the time, 50 milligrams, 75 milligrams. And then when people kind of, in order to reassess their mineral status, did another hair test three months later, they all had way out of all of reference range zinc levels. So it was very clear to me that uh, zinc on a daily basis should not be dosed at 50 milligrams per day ongoing. It is clearly a replenishment dose, but not a maintenance dose. Uh, zinc is not a micromineral or trace mineral, but it's also not a macro mineral like calcium, um, um, magnesium, and also uh, sodium potassium. So it's kind of in between. And we have to treat it that way. Uh, zinc is also being used and overused because it's uh, good for the immune system, uh, in form of lozenges for, for um, sore throats. Um, there's also an application of zinc when it comes to uh, fertility, especially for men, and also for prostate health. But too much or uh, more doesn't help more. <laughs> so by, I dosed my product specifically at 23 milligrams uh, elemental zinc, because this way you have a chance to start out with two capsules per day for two weeks. And that, from my point of view, is enough to provide uh, a replenishment, replenishing dose. After two weeks, the adult then doses down to just one a day, 23 milligrams per day, and that dose can be given ongoing without risking uh, zinc dominance in your system. Uh, Ali is asking whether caffeine from coffee affects iron absorption. Um, I believe I understand where you're coming from, and I believe that you were hurt that tea is uh, interfering with iron absorption. And the, 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 the reason, for, and that is true, uh, very true, especially black teas, especially uh, 
black tea that has steeped uh, a little bit longer, but there's also a handful of uh, herbal teas that contain tannins, which is a poly polyphenol group of substances that tan mucous membranes. Actually, tea can be used to tan leather, a natural uh, uh, tanning process. But these tannins also love iron, and uh, they actually bind very strongly to iron. And if you um, and there's tea drinkers that practically have a one of these here in their hand 24-7. <laughs> so they're constantly drinking tea. Uh, and if they then use one or two doses of iron, no matter what kind of iron, uh, practically the tannins in the tea would right away bind to iron and none of that iron is absorbed. Um, so that refers to tea. Coffee, to my knowledge, does not have tannins. Coffee by itself is acidic, which would actually aid the absorption of iron. So I can put you at ease here um, that iron does not affect, uh, sorry, that coffee does not affect uh, iron absorption. Caffeine doesn't either. Uh, caffeine has diuretic properties. Uh, so it actually, if you don't replenish otherwise with, with water, it might lead to dehydration, cellular dehydration. Um, so I always, my standard recommendation is if you are a real coffee drinker and you drink lots of it per day, you might want to consider cutting back and then drink good herbal teas and water and lemon water uh, for the second half of the day. You will, um, I think you will like it. We don't need that much coffee. One or two cups, good ones in the morning, that should suffice. Livia is saying, uh, great presentation. Thank you, Livia, and thank you for your time. Here's another question from Sue. Well, it's actually a comment. I think doctors are not knowledgeable about supplements. They just fluff it off. I agree 100%. There's really only a few that are interested and in that actually use them therapeutically. Uh, those physicians... Uh, they are either so-called orthomolecular practitioners or functional medicine practitioners, and they use the knowledge they have from medicine, from studying medicine, and 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 and, and uh, the various uh, disciplines of medicine, and then combine them with uh, with nutritional support. The same applies to pharmacists. And ninety-five percent of pharmacists really have they don't have no interest in nutrients or supplements. They couldn't be bothered even though as pharmacists, they are perfectly positioned to combine the knowledge and actually give you good advice. And I mean, just to give you a bit of idea, in the beginning when I started Pure Life Vitamins, I, as a pharmacist, I thought, okay, that's going to be an easy peasy path here. I'll just talk to all my pharmacy uh, colleagues and they were all going to carry my line. And uh, like, it's like, talk to the hand. <laughs> all they want to do is sign prescriptions. They don't want to talk. They don't want to think. They don't want to put one and one together. They just, I don't know what they want. Have a boring life. Uh, I really uh, enjoyed putting the puzzle pieces together. It's not an easy path and it's a long process and you never know it all. I certainly don't think I do. I just kind of try to condense everything I read and, 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 put it into, perspe into perspective and apply common sense. Practically, all I do is common sense. And I think that common sense got lost in mainstream medicine. And I could get on, go on about this for a long, um, long while. Um, I don't know. Let me see what Ron asked here. He... Oh, I think, uh, Ron, you asked something about uh, low, high BP, low BP. That is a cautionary note uh, in regards to NAC uh, that I am forced to put on the label because Health Canada requested. I have not found any evidence that is, is uh, referring to NAC causing any effect on high blood pressure or low blood pressure. But I mean, since you got me on this, I will actually... Uh, take note and 
try to find any further information here. To me, it's uh, not relevant. That's where it came from. Okay. Carlo says, thanks. Thank you, Carlo. And we're coming to an end here. Uh, Another question from Sue. I always have to put things like, um, well, I'll just read the question. All right. uh, if you have candida and need more acid, can you end up with too much acid and cause other problems? I believe I understand your question, that you're referring to gastric acid, that, that um, your natural barrier in the stomach is not sufficiently present anymore and that for that reason candida or yeast is starting to thrive in your gastrointestinal tract because of the lack of acidity in the stomach and also because of the lack of of uh, digestive juices and, and bacterial flora in the lower portions of the gastrointestinal tract and if i'm right here um, then yeah you would need more acidity in your stomach. Um, I would, in order to give you good advice here now, I would need to know your age and a bit more history to give you some ideas on how you could proceed and actually uh, succeed in fighting candida back into, into its place. Candida itself is part of our natural flora. And only if a... a, a, a uh, flora disbalance happens, favoring the reproduction of this yeast, uh, then you are in this state of high candida overgrowth, and there is things you can do to fight back. Um, but I would need to know more. It's not an easy topic, and I, in order to give you an uh, intelligent answer, I would, excuse me, I would need more information. Um, okay, this is John again from Well, Well, Well in St. Catharines. <laughs> and he's asking, how much copper per day with zinc would prevent imbalance in the body? I, I kind of said it in the presentation. Copper is a true trace mineral, um, even though it's dosed at like one or two milligrams per day. Um, but again, in my experience, based on the uh, hair mineral test results I've seen, uh, uh, copper is it should not be used daily. Uh, even at one milligram per day, which is which is what I make, the copper glycinate, I recommend to use this alternating one month off, one one month on. Um, and I always also give you um, an image or. And you might have, like, not so much today anymore, but uh, maybe 20, 30 years ago, people were using copper bracelets um, on their wrists. They came in all kinds of forms, thin and wide, and some had like turquoise <laughs> embedded and stuff like that. And then you, especially in the summer when sweat uh, uh, came into the play, uh, you would see that they had like black uh, discoloration around the bracelets, which is practically copper oxide. Um, and a deficient body would just <laughs> absorb that. But because they were wearing this copper bracelet for, for sometimes years, their bodies were full. And whenever I saw a person like that in the pharmacy or anywhere else, at a rock concert or wherever I see people, I would actually make an effort and go and walk up to that person and say, please take off this bracelet now because you are full of copper. You are in complete copper overload. And uh, similar things I've seen in, uh, in hair mineral tests. And um, so from my point of view, with what, what I've seen in the testing, using zinc at, as maintenance at 23 milligrams per day ongoing throughout the year, uh, my recommendation for copper would be to take, uh, like mark in your calendar, January, March, May, July, and so forth are my copper months, and you take one, one milligram capsule a day. The other months are off months. And with that, I almost guarantee you to be in balance and within range. 
that's why I dose it at, at that strength. I'm not just rolling the dice when I formulate. And Sue says, thank you. Great. That was the last question. Um, it's now almost 8 o'clock, so we did almost 90 minutes here. I always have fun with the Q&A. It's actually the best part. Um, I hope you had a good time and, and, and some knowledge. Uh, if you feel overwhelmed and overloaded, the good thing is you're all going to get uh, an email with the link to the recording of this. So you could, if you, say, if you kind of think, uh, um, oh, he said something there that I, I can't uh, remember, you can always go back. It will go up on our website and uh, our YouTube channel. You can use the links to refer friends and family. Um, yeah, makes me happy when I spread my word and my common sense. And uh, yeah, thank you all very much. There's more thank yous coming in here. Thank you, Shirley. That is a very nice, uh, yeah. And always forget, I always say, pills are not the answer. No? If we, if we experience lifestyle-induced diseases and conditions, then only changes in lifestyle and diet can actually change the causing effects. Nutrients can only kind of help you rebalance what was maybe missed or, or missing for some time. You, some of the nutrients can give you very quick symptom relief think about magnesium and and uh, spasms or magnesium and relaxation or in migraines you know, like some people came back the next day thinking oh my god i've never felt like this and gave me hugs you know? um but yeah i think we all got to take a, a long uh, a, a wide step back and really think about what lifestyle really means you know um, exercise daily you know? stress happens daily Exercise needs to happen daily. Look at your food. Cut back on carbs. Don't, re don't cut them out, but cut back. Huh? Increase the right kind of things. Reduce the coffee. Reduce the alcohol. Um, I enjoy food and, and drinks just as much. You know? But if, I think it's the balance that, that is the key here. And if you already have progressed into disease, um, then... I think you have to take a much bigger look at, at diet and lifestyle and, and make really, and not forever, but make some drastic changes right now to work your way back out of chronic disease. And I think it's possible. And then once you kind of rebalanced uh, after a little while, you can slowly kind of bring in the good stuff into your life. It's never forever. Balance is the key. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, yeah, most of the um, retailers that you saw on the, on the last uh, slide there are actually currently running uh, specials on, on the products that we discussed. So definitely go out and have a look there. Have a great evening. Thank you all for your time and see you next time. Thanks. <laughs>